Hi, good afternoon. Um, let's talk about colour. Colour. Colour is what I've been involved with for um, many years, um, but a particular, the particular series that I'm going to show you examples of um, starts in uh, about 2007. Um, but really, I'm answering the question of why yellow? Uh, why you? You know, why are you just focusing on yellow? What I believe is colour is a language. That's where I'm coming from. I postulated that idea that, or question to myself is, is colour a language? And if it is a language, um, surely I can I become literate in it? And therefore, can I understand it and uh, express it in a, in a, in a new way? Uh, have more liberty with my sense of colour and how I use it? Um, if you go onto my website, which you can to web, um, there's a, a piece that I wrote, which, well, I've done a number of uh, papers on colour, but one that you might find interesting and helpful rather than me going over and over stuff is called Lost in Translation, and it's about pigment um, as dirt, pigment as colour. It's a, p a PDF. Is it, if it isn't, it will be soon, um, but I know it's been on, but I feel like taking it off. Um, if you go on to uh, my website, you'll see lots of images. If you go on to CeliaLendisGallery.com, you'll see my last show in February. Um, lots and lots of images of paintings, sculptures, prints, the way I'm working through many different mediums to try and uncover um, the qual qualities of colour. Um, what you'll see is work on uh, the colour red, the work of the colour orange, and the colour or uh, first complementary orange and blue. Uh, so, why this investigation of colour? It came about when I was teaching at the Slade, um, constantly being um, perplexed how some students didn't know certain colours or know certain fundamentals about colours. And these are things, oh, you say, oh, so you were taught them. No, no, I wasn't really taught anything about colour. I've the main people who have taught me about colour is going to museums uh, and art galleries and looking at other people's paintings and going, why is that working? How's that? How's that? Um, what colour ground is this on? What, what, what's happening where? What kind of palette are these? Um, what kind of colours are they using? And what colours are they not using? Um, so it's come from an investigation of looking, looking and asking questions through looking back at art history. Uh, especially. Um, now the interesting thing about colour is it's it's very difficult to be, though we are constantly, theoretical about it. Wittgenstein, Ludwig Wittgenstein, um, talked about um, uh, language that we can't step out of it because we're in it. I think it's exactly the same way with colour because colour only exists in our brain. Um, it goes on in here. We're our brain, our eye brain, is deciphering all this light that's going on around us and making it into constants, colour constants, making it simplified, uh, simplifying these extreme complexities of colour. Now, some people have had the uh, um, bonk on the head, and if you read Oliver Sacks' book, it's very, very good. Um, uh, there's a very, very good uh, piece called, in an anthropologist on Mars, called The Case of the Colourblind Painter. It's about a man who loses colour. So l colour can be lost. The interesting thing about um, um, Semi Ezeki's book, um, uh, In a Vision, he talks about um, the way the artist's brain work. Now, if we look at the way the artist's brain work, we can look at uh, the mapping of the brain into a number of areas in the visual brain, but a number of areas like colour, tone, um, uh, rhythm, movement, um, space, and uh, form. So it's five, and there's, there's more, but those five areas. Now, those five areas are what I always have pushed in my set, in teaching students in, in those separate areas to really um, investigate, to become tonally conscious, and to be shape conscious, form conscious, um, spatially conscious. And, uh, and it's quite right, because each of those areas has a separate area of the visual brain. They all share each other but share with each other, but they're separate. So the more we push, the more we become conscious of them, the more we become literate in those areas, um, the, the more able we're able to um, 
uh, make sense of our ideas and, and put them down in what Winnicott called the third area. If we think of our, our world in terms of what's out there as one area, what's in here as another area, and what Winnicott called the potential space, the third area is where our stuff comes out and comes out onto paper or onto canvas. We're making sense of ourselves. So, Wittgenstein's talks about, um, so I'm taking out on Wittgenstein's idea of what he's talking about is colour is a way of life. In other words, we can't step out of it. We're always in colour. Colour, we exist in colour. So to theorise about colour is a bit problematic because we can't actually step out of it. And language is more about um, being in it and experiencing it. Um, now, the important thing for a painter about colour, to theorise about colour, there's a lot of theories of colour, a lot of stuff, there's, pick your theory, really, um, is that uh, for an artist, colour is stuff, it's, it's dirt, it's pigment, it's not, and as, uh, it's not science, um, there is a science in it, but it's about, a pro we want to, we want to as artists, want a practical application to understand colour. Now, there's many books on colour, and they always talk about, they start off with physics, and they talk about the way light split. It's fantastic, very, very important, but the only trouble is, and all these colour wheels and da, 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 is great, but when it comes down to it, what light does as colour is completely different to what pigment does. Um, so we need to understand that pigment is pigment, it's not light, and it never will be. We, we can't put all the colours together and get white light, white paint. You know, it doesn't look, we just get sludge. Um, so it's a different understanding. It's stuff. It's a material quality. It's, it's sensual. Um, um, it's got texture to it. It's got form to it. It's uh, uh, very sensual as well. And it, um, it can be thin, it can be thick. It's got all sorts of qualities. And because it's pigment, it's stuff, each pigment changes as you mix it, say I'm using for oil paint, it's cold pressed linseed oil. So I want to come at it as a, as a practicing painter, uh, not as a chemist or a physician, I'm not. Um, uh, my son is, and he brings lots and lots of exciting, as he brings lots of exciting thoughts into that, into me. Um, um, but for me, I'm coming as an artist and I want it to be practical and of use. Um, so, if we look at the great colourists who have written about colour, like Itten, Albers, Kandinsky, um, and cage theory stuff, uh, history of colour, but let's Itten, Albers, Kandinsky. Now they wrote, wrote, wrote some fantastic things and they did some amazing paintings. But a lot of their treatise, when you look at it, it's all into rectangles and squares and that. Now for me, again as a very organic person, organic painter, about, that I like places, I like stuff, I like... Um, the all rectangles and squares, which, yes, I understand about those things. But when I'm out in the landscape, it's and when I'm looking at human beings and things, I'm seeing forms and shapes, which are not really like that. Um, that sense of uh, form is much more complex. Um, so it's much more human. It's not so geometric, so hard. Um, also, um, I think colour has those qualities. And of course, because colour only exists in me as a human being, everything's going to be human. In other words, I'm going to human stuff through me to understand it. Um, also, uh, because I'm full of um, not just sighted things, I'm, I'm full of other senses. I'm full of emotions. Um, colour as a language will be wrapped up in all my human stuff that I carry. My history. Um, my culture. Um, so... I'm looking, trying to uh, have an investigation to be liberated of colour. Um, and um, one way I found to uh, talk about colour is, um, it's quite simple, but and um, not very good academically because I'm told it's folksy to talk in this way, um, but colour like cooking. And the interesting thing about cooking is, um, and really, if you want to learn about colour, then you need to become a cook. Because um, the great colourists don't use a lot of colour. They're very sparse with their colour. Matisse, Bonnard, Grillard, these artists are using colour very, very carefully. And oh, there's plenty of other ones too. They're using it very carefully. 
Um, and it's like like good cooking. You, you you don't get the whole larder out and just pour it on. You get you get and get get sludge. You select, and with your herbs and your spices, you select. So if you're doing something with meat, just say you've got a bit of lamb and you're thinking, well, how am I going to do that? Then you're thinking of what will go with that. You might say, oh, some mange too would go because they're quite nutty and crisp. And then you might say, well, I might do some, I might have potatoes with that, but how would I do that roast? Or uh, am I, uh, you know, all the time. And what might my herbs might I put with those potatoes? So all the time you're thinking of one thing against another. So there's no fish in this because it's lamb. You know, and there's no curry, there's no this, there's no, there's no other, you know, which vegetables am I selecting? Uh, you know, I'm not having a cauliflower with everything, or baked beans, um, or tomato ketchup. You know, I'm, it, it's about, um, you say, oh, this is a culinary experience. No, it's about a taste experience. Um, so it's to do with taste, smell, it's texture. Um, and all those things are like we get in, in, in colour, in our, in, in our painting. Um, so let me think. Um, so every time you start, like I, I, I spoke before about uh, at the beginning of these vlogs, when the studio was empty, it's like how you begin is a really important question. So what do you begin with? Um, so um, squeezing out all those same colours every time is going to be why. Um, you will make habitual the same mistakes all the time and the same successes all the time. But you're not learning anything new. So the whole thing of um, the size of the world you're making, in, in other words, the size of the canvas you're making, the size of the paper, uh, will determine what you can fit in it. I mean, it's logical. If you, if you buy a house and you've got a front room or a bedroom and you say, oh, I'm going to put this giant bed in it, well, it won't fit. So you've got to think, what am I going to fit in this space? You know, what, what, what kind of relationship of thing, of the content to the form is, go is going on in there? What kind of surface am I wanting on this? A slippery surface, an absorbent surface? Um, is it a light surface? Is it a mid-tone surface? Is it a dark surface? Is it a hot, cold surface? Um, then, what palette, in other words, what ingredients am I going to bring to this? What language game am I going to play on, in this world that I'm making? So I go to my larder, I go to all my pigments and select um, to choose. And you say, oh, I don't, I don't know. Well, then take a handful to begin my, I think it might be this, or say, I've got a problem, which is what I'm doing. I'm going to see what I can do with the red family. I'm going to break the red family into dark reds, middle reds and light reds, and see what I can find. So I select, and maybe I'll only select, select four pigments, so that's what I do. Um, so, let me just think. So it's thinking what is the right um, selection, the language game, for the unique journey that I want to make with this. Because every painting you make is unique. Otherwise, you're repeating yourself. I mean, you say, oh, well, that's all right. I can repeat myself. I can make a series. Good. Okay. That's good. That's, yeah, I agree. I do that all the time. Um, but we've got. But be careful, because going back to that great uh, a short essay by Beckett on Proust, be careful, because we are creatures of habit. We will want our saviors all the time are our habitual things that will save a painting so we bring in this this and this and it will save the painting and then we get them all out and um, they all look the same so it's really important when you're working on stuff to keep putting stuff up so you can look at it contemplate it reflect on it and then look and think oh wait a minute I'm, I'm using the same I've, I've solved it in the same way now what would happen if I put did this instead um, so it's having stuff that is not only good to reflect on it, it's good to see if we're just repeating ourselves all the time. So um, thinking how you start, as Alice said, it's interesting in Alice in Wonderland, it's where do you begin? You, to begin at the beginning, you need to go to the end, but what are you going to begin with? What journey, which hole are you going to go down? Um, and... Each time you start, it's treat it as a new language game, a unique experience. Um, otherwise, sameness will create no surprises. It's like eating the same foods all the time. Um, it's about being curious, remaining curious. So how you start determines how you're going to go on. Um, remember, colour is 
emotive too. It's full of emotion. It's very, very complex. And we're complex. Human beings are really complex, aren't we? I mean, some of us are more complex than others, but you know, we're, we're all, we've got stuff, we've got histories, and all of them will be tied up with colours. Certain things we like, certain places. So we go into a certain place, or uh, you might like wearing a, a certain shirt or a certain dress or something, and you feel really good. You feel sexy, or you don't. You feel very smart. And certain colours do certain things for you. Certain colours have, you know, so they're having a motive. Um, certain combination of colours um, create or suggest things of anger, love, passion, sex, loss, death. All those things um, are, if you like, on top of as or as well as the, the composition. So the composition which can be done through drawing, hence behind me, so the black and white, the linear stuff, the tonal stuff. And then it's like saying, but what, what emotion am I going to project into this? What kind of thing am I doing? Look, you go to a wood and you photograph it, okay? But do you get hold in your photograph? I know you can with photography and fantastic photographers. But do you get, when you go in that wood, you're scared? Or you're picking something up you think, I think there's something terrible that's happening in that wood. And that's what you want to paint about. Well, how do you paint that fear? Or I go to that place and it's just so beautiful. I'm so peaceful. I'm relaxed. I, I just, I'm so happy there. How do you get the happy colours? We say they're like that. So you, you do the same colours there and you think, well, that's not it. Because it's more. It's more than just two eyes. It's all the other stuff that we carry with us. Our emotions, our excitement, um, our intellect our histories. Um, so it's thinking of a well-crafted, a really well-crafted meal. Um, it's, it's an experience. Um, and in that sense of constructing something, it was where do you want to go with that? Where do you want to go with that palette? Whether it's abstract, figurative, narrative, you know, it, it, it doesn't matter. We're all human and you can jump between the two because we're, we're intensely abstract as human beings. Most of our stuff isn't visible. I mean, all the emotions. Well, you know, what does anger look like? Well, we know what the outworkings of it, but you feel it. You've really, that intensity. Well, what does it look like? What colour is it? What colours is it? How does it feel? What kind of thing? What, what does it go like? You know, if you think of, you know, the musicians, think of, you know, it's just sounds. Sounds that have strong imaginative, narrative qualities to it. Remember, we're full of other senses. All that can come into the painting. All that can come into the work, into the sculpture, textile, all that kind of stuff. Bring in the synesthetic colours, synesthetic things. In other words, the mixing of the senses. Remember, we're all born synesthetic. We just often lose it. But the more you push into you know, what is red, look into the whole experience of redness. I know I've said this to my students many times, but dyslexics have an advantage. I'm a dyslexic, um, is that because we're wired up differently and we've had to defend ourselves, you know, f or find solutions to because we don't quite see or perceive the world in the same way that um, other people do. And of course, all dyslexics are different. But what we do, we we found ways to cope. We found new channels, and therefore we process things differently, and therefore we're very creative in our processing. So therefore, if you're a dyslexic, you have a great advantage. The other thing about colour that's interesting, um, because it's a different part of the brain to tone, colour is very much to do with hot and cold. Um, therefore, it's not to do so much with light and dark, which is interesting, because we're all on a continuum, some way between being haptic, in other words, touch-orientated, and very sighted-orientated. Now, for the person who's very haptic, very touch-orientated, in other words, you're into surfaces and um, sensualness of touch, hot and cold. You, have, you will have more likely a better understanding of colour because your understanding of what hot and cold is. So many people I say, um, is that a hot or cold colour? And they go, I don't know. But what do you think? And so you need to, if you're slightly blind in those areas, and we're always blind in certain areas, um, we need to investigate them so we can become sensitive. We can become have experience in those areas. 
And the most important thing is we need to have the experience. There's no point in living. There's no point in living in like in those in in in, in the television. You know, watching like cookery programs all the time. Is we're hungry. You know, we're not fed. We don't taste the wine. We don't taste the food. And we turn off the telly, and we're willing to just go and make a meal for ourselves. You know, we don't go. Wow, that's fantastic. You know, I feel absolutely full up. No, we're living in secondhand experience if we're not careful. I mean, it's seriously dangerous. Um, therefore, getting, you know, getting books out and just reading about color. You know, we need to enter color. We need to experience it. And that's why going back to, you know, sometimes you put on a smart suit and you put on a beautiful dress, a certain color, and you feel fantastic. No, don't worry, I don't put on beautiful dresses, but. You feel different, um, and it's like, wow. Well, what's all that about? You can use that. It's that it's experiencing color, or it's like when you taste something and you go somewhere with it. Well, you, where's that? Why don't you use that in your work? It's waking up to all the things that we experience. So, what I'm going to do now is, I'm going to show you this. Now what we have here is my colour grammar and we're going from red violet there, the three reds, three oranges, three yellows, three greens, three blues, three blue violets and violet and I've assorted them. Now what you see in that colour wheel, so that's got all 22, if you just look at down there in the centre one, there's 22 each side. So there's 88 in all, if you add that, 88 each side. So that's my colour grammar. And I've made paintings of all of these. Now what I'm doing and what you're seeing in the first series of prints, I'm playing with the red series. So each red painting, whether the earth or the spectral, has four different reds. So I'm experiencing. So the, the subject of the colour is red, those four red pigments. And the lead colour is the one nearest each other. So there's a protagonist red, and then the other three, a chorus, trying to talk to it. So I've made things, and I'm going to show you those in a minute, to do with dark red, middle red, light red, earth red, and spectral. Now, earth's one side, and spectral's the other. Now, I, I believe that colour is like that. It's a duality. It's, there's the earth colours and the spectral colours. What I mean by the spectral colours, um, the ones on the right, these are the colours like the rainbow. We see them in the rainbow and they have an order to them. We can all agree on that, that's not theory. We can see that in the light, in a, in a rainbow in the landscape. But those earth colours, earth-like colours, are not in the spectrum, but they're still reds. Oranges, yellows. Now, see, see the yellow ones? That's the yellow, uh, spectral on the right, earth on the left. And then the greens, you say, what that, what's that white? It's a very strange colour, the white one in the green, it's called mazicot. And soon, because it's been in the box, it'll go green. And then, and then we get to the blues. And in the blues, um, you'll see in the earth sets, there's white. There's, the, there's, no, there's no blues. Well, there's no earth blues. That's where I put white, and then the greys, and then you see black. And then we get into the earth violets. And for all of those, I'm making paintings. And what you're going to see is a series of... You're going to see the series of prints, and I'm going to marry those up. So I'm, what I'm going to show you is the red ones, the orange ones, and then the orange-blue ones. And that's as far as I go. So why yellow? I'm working with the colour yellow because I'm trying to experience what yellow is by only working within the family of yellow. So the, the idea of what is yellow? Well, I'm experiencing and being inside yellow, and then I'm experiencing that complementary yellow-violet. Um, which is a light dark contrast but how can I ever really say what is yellow without actually entering it and entering it only by being in the yellow family it's easy to go yellow a uh, yellow red you know it's like playing with two different cultures two completely different experiences but within yellow I, saw, I, I, I get to learn about the breadth and size and the hugeness of what yellow is and what light yellow is middle yellow is, and dark yellow or what I would call um, yellow orange, yellow orange, um, mid yellow and light yellow.
before we get into greens. And you'll see some of the yellows are getting are getting a green. They're getting a greenness to them. Okay, I hope that helps. And next time I'm going to talk about why print. Spectral dark red. Earth dark red. Two together making dark redness. Mid-red spectral. Earth mid-red. The two together making earth middle red. Spectral light red. Earth light red. The two together making light red. This print is called redness and is about grace but the idea it's using both spectral and earth of all the reds. Spectral orange red called the platonic forms. Earth red orange called the song of the dentist's son. I come from a very long line of dentists but I'm not one. So orange red and what we have here is the platonic forms that are inner world and our inner heritage and Song of the Dentist Son which is my heritage for that I come from a long line of dentists. Mid orange called truths, earth mid orange called gentleness. Mid orange, gentleness and truth. Light orange, desire. Earth light orange, empathy. Empathy and desire, light orange, orangeness, listen. There you go. Now you can see my kind of construction, my uh, one of my wind loom pieces, and in the last view as well. This is from the series Thoughts in Search of a Thinker, and we're playing with, um, these were done in Spain, turquoise, um, against an earth orange. So a blue against a certain orange. From the same series, the blue against an earth orange. This is from the Icelandic series of 10. The other one was of 14. And this is um, a copper blue green against a dark turquoise against an against orange. I'm just showing a selection this again is from the Icelandic series. This is from the German series from Regensburg. So this is um, a zirconian cerulean, a very transparent cerulean against orange from the Regensburg series. Manganese blue against orange. This is from the Brittany series. I've just shown you a selection from the 60 prints and this is the final print and this is cerulean against oranges and is called the beautiful architecture so it's the culmination of the series thoughts in search of a thinker i hope that's given you some help just to show what investigation of color so as you've seen in the studio and the yellow series i'm investigating and i just i don't know where i'm going to go as i said at the beginning i just see what what the pigments bring out of me what forms and shapes bring out of me and this is where I went in this series.